Hello everyone, I'm Professor Paul Carrier and what I'd like to do now is discuss some of the issues relating to class 11 of contracts 1. Remember last time uh, we finished the second class on damages. The first class, which was class 9, dealt with common law damages. And as you recall, we had restitution, reliance, and expectation damages. Expectation damages broken down into the general ones, those that naturally flow, and the special ones, those that don't necessarily or naturally flow from a breach. And related to those last ones is the material for class 10, which was the special requirements of uh, the right to receive damages, which is particularly important regarding the special ones that don't, do not naturally follow from a breach. And as you recall from last week, we had three major requirements. There had to be some level of certainty, so it couldn't be a very uncertain calculation. If it's a very uncertain calculation, that kind of award cannot probably be made. It can't be proved. And then a court could look to perhaps give reliance damages or restitution damages, or possibly even, if there's no other good option, but there's clearly damage, the right to specific performance which is something we cover, in fact, next week, in week 12. Uh, the second element is foreseeability. The party who's supposed to pay for these damages should have known about it. Okay, And the reason why is because that party may get more insurance. That party may charge a higher price to cover the risk. That party may decide not to enter into the contract. If both parties know exactly the risk, both can make the best business judgment and no one gets hoodwinked. No one gets cheated. And so if a party it has no idea that certain damages might be possible for its breach, perhaps it shouldn't be responsible for those. Okay? And it's not good business overall to have people hide what they might lose and only spring it on a party after the contract has been signed. Okay? Um, the third element with regard to uh, damages that are harder to receive because they're somewhat harder to prove. You have the uh, certainty, foreseeability, and don't forget the Florida-specific language, the avoidability. And the idea is, and by the way, this is something that works exactly the same way in the UCC Article 2-715, I believe, which would be Florida Statute 672-715 one of the subsections. You have no duty to avoid these special or uh, in UCC parlance consequential damages. However, if you could have avoided them acting reasonably and you did not, you do not deserve the consequential damages um, that you could have prevented had you taken those reasonable steps. So the, the idea is, again, some jurisdictions like to say call it the duty to mitigate. Well, it's the duty to try to avoid, it's the acting in good faith to try to avoid readily avoidable damages, and your failure to act that way disqualifies you from receiving them because you could have fixed the problem had you acted reasonably. So that's the third one from last week. Now we are going into, we provide a complete week on UCC-type damages. Remember, you would, not, you would start by... a looking for a sale of goods. If you see the sale of goods in a formed contract with sale of goods, then you identify a breach like mailing too late, uh, like failing to paint the whole, well, that wouldn't be paint, failure to ship the whole shipment, things like that. Failure to pay. You can establish breach, uh, and you, as you recall, we covered breach a little bit in Chapter 8. Um, and then after you see breach, you start to try and look at the damage. The UCC and the state adoption of the same starts with the damages that the seller gets if the buyer breaches. And there are a bunch of things that can happen. For example, a seller knowing that there's a breach, if he or she still has the goods, can suspend the shipment, right? Or suspend any future deliveries until it's cleared up. So there are a group of things. There is a list of things that a seller with a breaching buyer can do, okay? But there are two or basically three main things, and uh, let me be clear, or let me be honest, 
uh, with a code with all these subsections and all these exceptions and different rules and other areas of the code, you can get very, very easily lost with UCC damages. That your, your understanding can spin out of control if you ask too many questions. So I strongly recommend a very, very sharp focus on what are the most likely things. Seller. You know, later we'll cover, next week when we cover equitable remedies, we'll cover an action for the price, which is specific performance. Just pay the price. That's next week. What if you're not going to get the price? What would a seller want to do? Well, the first thing is he could resell. You don't buy mine. You're breaching. I'll just sell to your competitor down the street. Perfect solution. And if the, if the new buyer doesn't pay as much as you would have paid, I get that differential. If I was going to sell them to you for $10,000 and the person down the street bought it for $9,000, you would have to pay me, if you breached, $1,000. Together with incidentals, what if I had an extra shipping cost to send it a little further? What if you were going to pick it up from my warehouse, but the other, other party would not? They'll pay me $9,000 and I have to deliver. See, so yeah, that's a simple example, but I would be entitled to $1,000 in what I'm losing on the contract between you and me, and I'd also get the shipping costs because that was caused by your breach. By the way, in UCC parlance, the costs to fix a problem after a breach are the incidental kinds. Okay, so we just talked about compensatory expectation general damages, the loss of my bargain with you, plus incidentals, and that is one of the seller's primary goals. Next, if you do not resell, you decide to keep it, uh, you can actually take a price differential. When you have the time and place of the breach, or when you learn of breach, I learn you breached, this is when I can either sell to somebody else or choose to just keep them in my warehouse. Okay, That's the moment that's operative. And I want you to be able to intuit that rather than just memorize it. When would a seller be able to take action to lower damages to protect him, her, or itself at the time of learning of the breach? So I could either resell or I could decide not to resell at the time I learned of the breach. So if I don't resell, I can take the market price at the time and place of breach, right? Really, if it's higher. If it's lower, I have no damage, okay? But if it's higher, then I can say... Uh, there's the market price minus the contract price. No, in fact, it's the opposite, isn't it? If the market price is higher, maybe I get nothing. If the market price is lower, if I did resell, I would get less. So I could opt for the market price, our contract price differential, again, plus incidentals. There probably would not be any, but it is possible. And that's in, the first one I talked about was in 2-706 of Article 2 UCC and the state adoption of same. The second one is in the 708s, 2708 sub 1. There's also 2708 sub 2. We call it lost profit or high volume seller. And the idea behind that is, what if you have 10,000 items and somebody doesn't buy one from you? Well, you can certainly wait and sell that to the next guy, right? But if the first party breached the contract, you have lost the profit on one sale. If I am selling a guitar and I resell to somebody else, I get my money back for that guitar and I'm not out anything. If I have 100 guitars, you don't buy yours, and I sell the one that you would have bought to somebody else, you would argue, well, you got your money for that guitar anyway. And I'd say, but I just missed another sale. If you bought a guitar and then he bought the next one I had in my inventory, I would have had two sets of profits. So that you took from me. Those naturally flow from breach. Okay, so technically those would be, in common law terms, expectation damages general because they would naturally flow. And those are the three primary concerns or deals or ways of thinking about it for a non-breaching seller. If there's a third-party contract that the seller would lose based on the buyer's failure, no recovery. The code is clear that sellers who should be in a position to protect themselves in advance from this very problem. They know a buyer may breach, so they can take care of it ahead of time. Insurance, uh, higher prices, whatever. 
sellers do not get consequential damages. So they get their expectation type. They get the, the expectation type you know, general. They can get their incidentals. And if for some reason it doesn't work, I suspect that they can also ask for restitution or reliance. Because remember, what the UCC doesn't cover is supplemented by the common law. Okay, but usually you never see that. The UCC formation, formulation of damages is almost always complete. I've never, I can't recall ever seeing reliance or restitution damages given. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about remedies for a non-breaching buyer. First thing is, if the buyer doesn't get the goods, buyer can buy from somebody else. We call that cover. And if a buyer covers at a higher price, the buyer should get that price differential, together with incidental damages, like extra shipping, and consequentials. So if the buyer made some further losses due to the seller's breach, the buyer is able to pass that one on. Sellers don't get consequentials. Buyers do, under the terms of Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code and the state adoptions the same, including Florida's. Um, and by the way, Whereas the seller damages run from between something like 2-703 to 2-7, I believe it's 709. Uh, the the uh, non-breaching buyer right to damages is covered after that in the 2711, 2712, 2713 area. Okay? What if the buyer doesn't want to cover? The buyer doesn't want to do anything. Well, the buyer can take a look at the contract price where the seller breached and look at the market price at the time and place, right, at the time of breach. Okay, when, you do, when the buyer knows that the seller will not perform. And remember, kind of like when the seller knew the buyer wouldn't perform, when the buyer knows he or she doesn't get the goods, that's the point where he or she can take steps to fix it. I can cover, I can decide not to cover, I can do something else. That's when the market price versus the real contract price differential is gauged. So again, you can intuit this. It's when the party can take steps to protect itself and to lower damages is when you take that market price differential. Okay? Uh, of course, that market price differential plus incidentals plus consequentials if there are any. And remember, just to remind, consequentials are of the same ilk as the expectation damages special, the kind that need to be certain, foreseeable, and non-avoidable, okay? And you can apply those rules to consequential damages requests of a non-breaching buyer. What if the buyer has accepted the goods, right? Didn't cover, uh, didn't buy a separate source, didn't buy nothing, but actually kept the goods. Maybe they're not great, but they're still not bad and we need them. What if it's wheat? The wheat's not perfect, you can buy a few extra things to fix it, okay? So you can keep and supplement. You may accept it, and then you probably would want, and you are certainly entitled to, warranty damages. What is the thing as promised, as warranted, differentiated from the thing as delivered or as received? If you they promised you excellent quality at 100, and they gave you good quality at 90, you've got a 10 point, ten dollar, ten whatever problem. And you should be compensated for that if it's under warranty. So um, you measure uh, at the time and place of acceptance. Not the day before, not the day after, but the date that they arrived and the buyer decides to accept them. Or has kept them too long and can't reject them anymore. Or cannot revoke acceptance. Something we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, well, uh, that's a fair amount, but keep, if you can just try and get your minds around those major possibilities, uh, everything else hopefully will fall into place, but you'll have enough basis to deal with a simple damages question with regard to UCC damages. If you remember those three seller preferences, expectations, and those three buyers ones, and uh, some sense of when you measure those price differentials as part of the um, expectation damage, the general kind.